Howard. What comes to mind when you hear the legendary filmmaker's name? There's so many things to choose from. Maybe the first thing that you thought of was his eight-year run on The Andy Griffith Show as Andy's son, Opie Taylor. That was from 1960 to 1968. And since Ron was born in 1954, he was just a child when he broke into Hollywood. Although, technically that wasn't his first role. That would go to an uncredited role in a 1956 film called Frontier Woman. Ron was just two years old then. Or perhaps your mind went somewhere more recent with another hit TV show, Arrested Development. Ron Howard was never seen on screen, but he provided the narration for the show. Maybe you're not thinking of any of that. Maybe you're thinking of one of the two films that Ron Howard has directed that we've looked at here on the podcast, either 1995's Apollo 13 or 2001's A Beautiful Mind. Of course, you'd be right for all of those and plenty more great movies and TV shows that come to mind when you think of the work of Ron Howard. And maybe a few not-so-great projects in there, too. Today, we're going to be looking at yet another movie directed by the legendary filmmaker. Starring Chris Hemsworth, Daniel Bruhl, and Olivia Wilde, 2013's Rush snuck in under the radar for many, despite being nominated for two Golden Globes and winning three BAFTA awards. Maybe one of the reasons it snuck in under the radar for many is because of the subject matter. Rush tells the story of a rivalry between two of the world's best Formula One race car drivers, a sport that apparently isn't as popular as space is. At least, that's what the U.S. box office would seem to imply. With a budget of $38 million, Rush would go on to make only about $27 million at the box office. For a bit of context, Apollo 13, made for about $52 million, came home with over $172 million at the box office. But let's not rush to judgment based on numbers alone. Instead, let's speed into the world of fast cars as we compare history with the movie Rush. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. It's time for Two Truths and a Lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode, then by process of elimination, you'll know which one was a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, James Hunt just barely managed to win the world championship in 1976, by a single point. Number two, the world championship in 1976 was the last time either James Hunt or Nicky Lauda would win a championship. Number three, Nicky Lauda bought his way into Formula One by taking out a bank loan. Before we get back to our story today, I'd like to send a special thank you to Soren Bowazny for sponsoring this episode. Soren joined up as an official producer for the podcast over on Patreon, so he's got early access to episodes as soon as they're recorded. But as part of being a producer, Soren picked a movie for me to cover here on the show. He actually gave me two great choices and said that I could pick between them. They were Eddie the Eagle and Rush. I decided to go with Rush since we've already looked at a movie set during the Calgary Winter Olympics in 1988. That would be Cool Runnings but mostly because I haven't covered any movies about Formula One racing before. But Eddie the Eagle is also another great choice, so hopefully I'll get to cover that one in the future as well. Thanks so much again, Soren, for supporting the show. I really appreciate it. And with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's version of Rush. We're greeted in the opening moments of the movie by text on screen. It's August 1976, and we're at the Nürburgring racetrack for the German Grand Prix. As the camera pans across race cars and their drivers, we hear a voiceover explaining that 25 drivers start every season of Formula One. Each year, two of those drivers die. So right away, we've got some details to verify, and those details from the movie aren't really true. There's not always the same number of drivers each season. For example, in the inaugural year for Formula One, 1950, there were technically 
81 different drivers who competed throughout the season, although only 22 of them ended up earning a position. The next year, 84 drivers with 19 earning a position. By the way, to earn a position, you have to actually score, even if it's a fraction of a single point. But I think you get the point. There were more than 25 drivers each season for Formula One, like the movie says. In fact, just three years after the sport officially kicked off, there were the most drivers ever at 108 drivers in 1953. As of this recording, the most recent season was 2017, and it saw 22 drivers. So if you're like me, your next thought might be, well, maybe the movie is talking about an average. Over the 66-year history of Formula One from 1950 to 2017, there's been a total of 3,056 drivers. That comes to an average of 44.9. Since it's really hard to have 0.9 or 9 tenths of a driver, let's just average that to 45 drivers per season. But then we have the next stat. Each year, two of the drivers who start the season die. Well, again, the numbers don't really seem to back this up. The first driver who lost his life was the British driver Cameron Earl, who crashed his car during a test run on June 18, 1952. That's two years after Formula One started, so the detail in the movie about two dying every year is already incorrect. Sadly, two did die the following year, though, in 1953. Then one in 1954. Three in 1955. As of this recording, the latest driver to pass away was the French Jules Bianchi, who died in July 2015 due to injuries from a crash during the Japanese Grand Prix during the 2014 season, October 5th to be more precise. Yes, a lot of Formula One drivers have died over the decades. In all, 51 drivers have died since 1950. That's 51 drivers across 66 years for an average of 0.77 drivers per year. Again, rounding to the nearest whole number, that's one per year. So while it's tragic to lose an average of one human being for a sport, at least it's not two. In fact, in an interview after the film Rush was released, Nicky Lauda himself commented that in the 1970s, they knew at least one or two drivers would die each season. Everyone knew that. And safety was a real concern that they tried to get under control. But that's easier said than done, and while efforts were underway to make the sport safer, not a lot of success had been made on that front by the time the core plot in the movie happens in 1976. After this introduction in the movie, we're taken back six years to 1970 and introduced to James Hunt. He's played by Chris Hemsworth. The main plot points here are the introduction of Nurse Gemma, who's played by Natalie Dormer, and the apparent fact that James Hunt is quick to sex with the ladies. Well, I couldn't find any proof of a woman named Gemma that James Hunt hooked up with in 1970, so that seems to be inconclusive. But we do know that James Hunt had a lot of sex, and that's something we see throughout the movie. In fact, some people have estimated James had sex with about 5,000 women in his lifetime. We might not know if Gemma was real, but that sort of scenario is certainly plausible. Oh, and as sort of a blanket statement, there's not a lot of details about some of the secondary characters in the film, like Gemma. So if you have more information about them that you can share, I'd love to hear it. Going back to the movie, James Hunt shows up with Nurse Gemma to the Crystal Palace racetrack in London in 1970. According to the movie, this is Formula 3 racing, and it's here that James first meets Nicky Lauda. Nicky is played by Daniel Brühl. So the specifics that happen in this sequence where James and Nicky meet aren't things that we can verify. For example, we don't know about someone named Gemma, so we don't know that James started dating the nurse that we saw earlier. But there's some things that we do know about Formula 3. Now, if you're not familiar with Formula Racing, basically, there's three levels of drivers. 
Formula 3 is the first one, then there's Formula 2, and of course, Formula 1. Think of it like the D-League in basketball, or maybe a better analogy would be the minors for Major League Baseball. There's different levels, like single A, double A, triple A, and then the majors. Players typically start in single A and rise through the ranks until they play in the majors. The same is true for Formula 1 racing. Most drivers start in Formula 3 and rise through the ranks before they can race for Formula 1. Of course, not everyone goes to Formula 3 and then Formula 2. Just like in baseball, sometimes a player can skip from double A to the majors or single A to the majors. It's less likely, but it happens. According to the movie here, both James Hunt and Nicky Lauda seem to have started their careers in Formula 3. At least that's the impression we get when Chris Hemsworth's version of James Hunt sees the newcomer Nicky Lauda for the first time across the track. This is sort of true, but there's more to the story. James Hunt actually started his racing career outside of Formula Racing altogether as a touring car driver. Touring car racing is not nearly as fast as Formula One racing, but they're typically using regular cars to get souped up or highly modified for racing purposes. For James Hunt in particular, he raced a Mini. That's the small cars from the British Motor Company. Since a majority of listeners are in the U.S., you might be familiar with the Mini Cooper. Technically, those are sort of a reboot of the original. The Mini Coopers you see driving around now in the U.S. are a subsidiary of BMW, the German car company, not the British Motor Company, or BMC. The Minis that James drove were iconic British cars that looked a lot like the Mini Coopers that we see on the road today, but those were technically discontinued in 2000. Anyway, in 1968, James Hunt started racing a little bigger cars and a little faster cars when he started Formula Racing. Not in Formula 3 yet, but Formula Ford. That's a little below Formula 3. It didn't take long for James to progress to Formula 3, though, which he did in 1969. So the movie is correct in showing that James Hunt raced at the Crystal Palace track in London. That happened on October 3rd. 1970. So far, everything seems to be in line with what the movie shows. So why did I say that it's sort of true? Well, that's because the events we saw at Crystal Palace in the movie did not happen like the film shows. In the movie, James Hunt and Nicky Lauda get into a bit of a tiff after James clips Nicky's car, causing him to lose control. They both slide and a near crash causes Nicky to lose the race while James Hunt continues on to win the race. It didn't happen like that because Nicky Lauda wasn't there. Instead, it was James Hunt and another driver named Dave Morgan. Near the end of the race, James and Dave's cars collided and both cars were out of the race. James was furious. He got out of his car, ran over to Dave's car, and pushed him to the ground. This event was highly controversial at the time, and although Dave Morgan ended up getting a 12-month suspension of his racing license... James Hunt was cleared of any charges and allowed to keep racing. So, if Nicky Lauda wasn't even at this race, where was he? Well, back in the movie, we see Daniel Brühl's version of Nicky Lauda get a bank loan to buy his way into Formula Racing. This after his well-off parents refused to finance him since they don't approve of racing as a career. That's true, but there's a key difference from what we saw in the movie. Like James, Nicky started his racing career in a mini car and worked his way up. In 1971, his career plateaued a bit and he decided to take a big risk when he took out a 30,000 pound loan to buy his way onto a Formula 2 team. That 30,000 pound loan is about the same as 504,000 US dollars today. It was only after this loan that Nicky would then take out another loan to buy his way onto the Formula 1 BRM team in 1973. So even though that was after the event that we saw in the movie, Nicky Lauda couldn't have been at the Formula 3 event we saw in the movie because he started his Formula Racing career at the Formula 2 level. Oh, and remember that little moment where Chris Hemsworth's version of James Hunt mocks Nicky Lauda and then he turns away and says to Nurse Gemma that Nicky looks like a rat? It's something that James says about Nicky throughout the movie. 
That little detail is true, but it wasn't a nickname that James Hunt came up with. The real Nicky Lauda explained in an interview with The Telegraph that the nickname was from some marketing guy from one of his sponsors, the cigarette brand Marlboro. That unnamed marketing guy thought that because of Nicky's buck teeth, it would make for a good nickname, and they put the rat on his visor. Technically, the movie never really says James Hunt came up with that nickname, but it sort of implies it. Still, there's no mention of the Marlboro marketing guy, so I think it's safe to say that the movie is a little bit inaccurate here. But the real James did use it quite a bit when talking to Nikki, if that counts for anything. Back in the movie, James Hunt makes it to the big time when the team's financer, Lord Heskith, shows him their new Formula One car. The movie makes it seem like they got the idea from Nikki to just buy their way in. Although we don't know if the specifics happened the way the movie shows, the overall gist is pretty accurate. Probably the biggest difference between what the movie shows and the true story is that James Hunt wasn't a part of the Hesketh team for as long as the movie shows. Remember the scene at Crystal Palace? Well, in the movie, we see Christian McKay's character, Lord Hesketh, there. But in truth, James didn't join the Hesketh team until 1972. During his time in Formula 3, before that, he was racing for a team named STP March. So the movie may have simplified the timeline quite a bit, but the end result is the same. Oh, and Lord Hesketh's real name was Alexander. Alexander Hesketh was a politician in the United Kingdom's House of Lords, so that's why they called him Lord Hesketh in the movie. Speaking of which, the next big plot point happens when we meet a new main character. This is Olivia Wilde's version of Susie Miller. According to a newspaper that nearby mechanics are reading while she's talking to James, Susie is a model. After this introduction to Susie, according to the movie, James and Susie get married. Apparently, after their first meeting. The movie seems to imply it was love at first sight, and marriage at second sight. The movie doesn't mention how much time has passed, but the only other year mentioned was back at the Crystal Palace track in 1970, although the movie does briefly mention a driver dying at Watkins Glen track. But the movie doesn't really mention who it was that died at Watkins Glen. And unfortunately, there have been two Formula One drivers who died at Watkins Glen. The first was Francois Sivert, and that was on October 6th, 1973. The second was Helmuth Koenig, exactly one year later, on October 6th, 1974. So, Really, the movie could have been mentioning either one of those because we know from history that this meeting between James and Susie took place in 1974. And James didn't propose when they first met. But it was fast. Only a few weeks after meeting, James proposed and on October 18, 1974, Susan Miller became Susan Hunt when the two lovebirds were married at the Oratory or sometimes called the Brompton Oratory. That's a slang term for the Church of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in London. Going back to the movie's storyline, while at his wedding, James gets some surprising news. Nicky Lauda has joined the Ferrari team. As the movie explains, Clay Regazzoni signed with Ferrari and insisted on bringing Nicky along because of his talents for setting up cars. There's not a lot of details about this deal between Ferrari and Regazzoni, other than it seems to be the catalyst for how Nicky Lauda joined the Ferrari team, which is good because there's not a lot of details that we can verify. What we do know is that in 1974, Clay Regazzoni left the BRM team to join Ferrari. He had raced for Ferrari before, from 1970 to 1972, but Ferrari themselves weren't doing so well. In 1973, a man named Luca Cordero de Montezemolo became the assistant of Enzo Ferrari himself. Enzo, of course, being the man who founded the Ferrari Auto Manufacturing Company. That same year, the Ferrari racing team, named Scuderia Ferrari, was in the midst of a slide. They were doing horribly, and things needed to change. So in 1974, Luca took the reins for Ferrari's Formula One team. This change in leadership also saw a bunch of other personnel changes as well as something that's important for our story today. 
It was because of those personnel changes that led to Clay Rigazzoni returning to Ferrari. When he did, just like we saw in the movie, it was Clay who recommended Nicky to the Ferrari team. He spoke so highly of Nicky that Ferrari offered to pay off all of Nicky's debts, including the loans that he'd taken out to buy his way onto the BRM team, if he would join their team. It was an offer too good to pass up. So even though the movie doesn't show the year, we know that Nicky Lauda joined Ferrari's Formula One team in 1974. After this, in the movie, we see Nicky meet up with a woman named Marlene Noss. She's at a friend's party that Clay takes Nikki to, but Nikki doesn't want to stick around, so he catches a ride with Marlene back to Trento, the nearest town with the train station. All of this is plausible, but unfortunately it's not something we can really verify because there's not a lot of documentation about when Nikki Lauda happened to meet Marlene. However, if I were speculating on accuracy, I'd venture to lean on the side of this being more accurate since we know that Nicky himself was a consultant on the film. Back in the movie, the next big plot point happens after James Hunt switches teams from Hesketh to McLaren. According to the movie, this happens when Lord Hesketh runs out of money and is forced to shut down his Formula One team. That's true. After Nicky Lauda won his first championship in the 1975 season, Lord Hesketh made the announcement that he couldn't afford to keep the team going without sponsors, and James Hunt was forced to find a job elsewhere. But just like the movie shows, he didn't have to wait for long, because just before the 1976 season began, a driver named Emerson Fittipaldi left McLaren's team. James was hired to take the vacant spot. That set up the thrilling 1976 season where James Hunt was racing for McLaren and Nicky Lauda was trying to defend his championship. In the movie, we see a montage of races from the 1976 season. The first race of the season is in Brazil, which Nicky wins. James takes second. Then in South Africa, the same result. Nicky first and James Hunt second. Then in Spain, according to the movie, something different happens. James Hunt takes first, and Nicky comes in second. After this, there's a measurement, and James Hunt is determined to be disqualified for his car being 1.5 centimeters too wide. As crazy as this seems, it's true, but the movie is speeding things up quite a bit. Perhaps appropriate for a film about racing, but what I mean by that is when it jumps from Brazil to South Africa to Spain— those were actually the first, second, and fourth races in the season. The movie skips over the race in Long Beach, California that was the third race of the 1976 season. Clay Rigazzoni took first place in that race, and Nicky came in second. A Frenchman by the name of Patrick de Paulier took third place. He's not really a focus in the movie, but if you look closely throughout the season, you can see Patrick's blue six-wheeled Tyrell car with the word Elf painted on it. Anyway, going back to the disqualification, when that happened, it didn't take long for the McLaren team to appeal the decision. The movie doesn't really focus on the reasoning for the appeal, but they said the measurement was inaccurate because of the tires expanding during the race, which certainly can happen as the car speeds along the track and the tires heat up. Two months later, just like the movie shows, the disqualification was overturned and James Hunt was given the victory for this race. According to the movie, James Hunt's wife, Olivia Wilde's version of Susie Hunt, doesn't seem to stay faithful to James. While James is racing, we see a newspaper with headlines talking about Susie hooking up with the actor Richard Burton. Of course, as a little side note, I like to call to attention the rumors of James himself having sex with over 5,000 women in his lifetime, so it's not likely he was staying faithful to Susan either. While the newspaper we saw in the movie was fictional, the story it told was not. Although it's worth pointing out that it happened a little bit earlier than what we saw in the movie. The film makes it seem like James Hunt was having a horrible first half of the season, then he's blindsided by this little infidelity with Susie, and that's what inspires him to turn it around for the second half of the season. It's sort of true, but not really. In truth, Susie left James closer to the end of the 1975 season, it was, though, for the actor Richard Burton, like the movie shows, 
And while the movie doesn't mention this outright, there's a moment where Chris Hemsworth's version of James Hunt implies not having to pay a divorce settlement. That's true. Richard Burton paid about $1 million for the divorce settlement. But all of that paperwork didn't happen overnight. Not to mention that Richard was married to Elizabeth Taylor at the time. So James and Susie's divorce was finalized in June of 1976. And then in July of 1976, Richard Burton divorced Elizabeth Taylor for the second time. Then in August of 1976, Richard and Susie were married. Speaking of marriage, the movie shows Nikki and Marlene getting married soon after this. The movie doesn't show any sort of date, but since we know that this is the 1976 season, it's safe to assume it's happening at some point in 1976. And that's true. According to the real Nikki Lauda, it happened much like what we saw in the movie, too. By that, what I mean is, it was quite an uneventful affair. Nikki explained in an interview with Huffington Post that the couple wanted to get married under the radar without any press. To give you an idea of how much planning went into the wedding, unlike what we saw in the movie, Nikki wasn't dressed up. As Nikki explained, they wouldn't perform the ceremony if he wasn't wearing a tie, though. So we found a random guy walking by with a tie and asked if he could borrow it for five minutes. Guy said yes, and just a few minutes later, the guy had his tie back and Nikki was married to Marlene. Back in the movie, the next major plot point happens on the Nürburgring racetrack in Germany. According to the movie, after a failed attempt to cancel the race due to rainy conditions, Nikki loses control going around a curve and the car bursts into flame. The movie is really subtle in explaining what happened, but if you listen closely, you'll hear a TV announcer explain that the Ferrari's fuel tank got punctured, and that's what caused the accident. Then, after his car burst into flames, another driver named Brett Lunger crashed into Nikki's car before getting out to help Nikki out of his burning vehicle. The movie got all of this pretty spot on. In fact, you can see actual footage of Nikki's car crash at Nürburgring in 1976 online. I'll make sure to put a link to it in the show notes at basedonatruestorypodcast.com if you want to check it out. Fortunately, the movie also got it correct that Nikki Lauda survived the horrific accident. The movie again speeds up the timeline here, but we see a few more races from Nikki's perspective in the hospital. There's the August 15th race at Osterreich and August 29th race at Zandvoort. These are accurate to the real 1976 season and were the 11th and 12th races of the season, respectively. Then the movie shows something remarkable. Not only does Nicky recover from his injuries, he does it in time for the race in Italy in September of 1976. Again, while the specific conversations and such may have been dramatized for the film, the overarching plot is quite true, including the remarkable recovery. After Nikki's crash in Germany, or more specifically West Germany at the time, on August 1st, 1976, Nikki suffered from severe burns to his head as well as inhaling scalding and toxic gas fumes the latter of which caused damage to his lungs and blood that probably would have been enough to kill him if the doctors hadn't extracted much of it, similar to what we saw in the movie. No one expected Nicky to return. The Ferrari team even scrambled to find a replacement driver to finish out the season, a man named Carlos Rutman. The movie mentions 42 days, which might seem a little on the nose since that's exactly six weeks. But that's how much time was between the race in Germany, where Nicky crashed, in the 13th race of the season in Monza, Italy, which is one of the suburbs of Milan, in case you're interested. And that's how long it took for Nikki to return. But before we continue, something interesting happens here in the movie. It's not really something the characters in the film come out and say, but the general sense that I got while watching this part of Nikki's recovery was yet another change in the characters. So, if before the big mid-season change for Chris Hemworth's version of James Hunt was after his wife left, in similar fashion, this recovery marked a sort of change for Daniel Brühl's version of Nicky Lauda. Except this time it was to offer some sort of respect for James Hunt as a competitor. At least, that's how I read between the lines in the movie. 
And if I read that correctly, it's not really true because according to Gerald Donaldson's excellent biography of James Hunt, the two racers were actually very friendly during their careers. So the movie pits the rivalry between the two drivers as if they're enemies, but in truth is really more along the lines of a very strong competitive nature between two great drivers. And that's something we see all the time in sports between great athletes of all sorts. For example, Nicky Lauda himself mentioned in an interview once how he actually spent the night at James Hunt's apartment after a night on the town in London. That's not something we see in the movie at all, but it's something Nicky recalled them doing early on in their careers. Of course, according to Nicky, it wasn't just he and James. As he clarified with a slight smile, there were four of us there that night. Anyway, after Nicky's amazing return from his accident in the movie, we see the film come to a close along with the 1976 season. That was, just like the movie shows, in Japan. And again, the movie accurately portrays the amazing comeback from James Hunt while Nicky was in the hospital that allowed him to come within just three points of catching up with Nicky Lauda. In the movie, this is made even more tense when Nicky Lauda starts the race and then decides to stop the race because, as he says in the movie, it's way too dangerous. That is very true. On race day, the Fuji Speedway track near Tokyo, Japan, saw a downpour of rain. Many of the drivers protested the race, but it continued for the same reasons the movie said, because there were already international television rights for the race. Everyone wanted to see the tense competition between James and Nicky. Calling off the race would mean losing an untold amount of money. That'd be like canceling the seventh game of the World Series when it's tied three games to three. Not going to happen. The filmmakers didn't really need to change much of the real story to make this interesting because, just like the movie shows, after two laps, Nicky Lauda unexpectedly pulled into the pit and withdrew from the race. He said it was way too dangerous to be driving out there in the heavy rains, and he was probably right. Remember, the last time he had driven in wet conditions, he barely escaped with his life. That set up a championship for James Hunt if he could hit third place. The movie doesn't really mention how the point system works for Formula One, and to confuse things even more, the point system used in Formula One racing today isn't the same as it was in 1976. So, as a little refresher, the basic concept is that there were 16 races in the 1976 season. There's not always 16 races. For example, in 1977, there were 17 races, but since we're focused on the 76 season, there were 16. For each race, the driver who came in first place earned nine points, second place earned six points, third place came away with four points, fourth place with three points, fifth place with two, and sixth place with one point. So that's why the movie mentions that in the last race, Nicky Lauda had 68 points and James Hunt had 65 points. James only really had to finish in at least third place to come away with the win. Well, sort of. The movie doesn't really mention this, but technically, James had more first place finishes throughout the season than Nicky did, with an advantage of 6 to 5. So, if James had come in fourth place and they ended the season tied with 68 points across the entire season, James Hunt would have won the title because the tiebreaker goes to whomever has more first place wins throughout the season. Something else the movie didn't really have to fake to add to the tension was how James Hunt came back from behind to take the victory. With about 11 laps left, the tires on James's car started to wear. Then one of his tires punctured, and like we saw in the film, he had to turn into the pit. While he was there, James lost his lead to the American Mario Andretti. It wasn't until there were only two laps remaining when James finally managed to claim and hold onto third place, until the end of the race. That finish gave him 69 points to Nicky's 68 points, just barely enough to become the world champion. The finish and victory was, as the movie shows, a surprise to James Hunt at the time. As the movie comes to a close, we see a montage of TV interviews and shots of James celebrating. There's a quick one that we see where 
Chris Hemsworth's version of James Hunt, is in a photo shoot next to a very scantily clad woman. That's a very real photo. Just a little minor detail that the movie adds. I'll include a link to the real photo in the show notes at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. This is part of a general storyline that explains the different lives that Nikki Lauda and James Hunt led after the 1976 season. While James is celebrating his victory with alcohol and women, Nikki is getting back to work to prepare for the 1977 season. Daniel Brühl's version of Nikki provides voiceover as he explains that James retired from Formula One only a couple years later and, sadly, passed away at age 45. All of that is true. Well, Nicky reclaimed his title in 1977, and again in 1984, James Hunt was apparently satisfied with just one title in 1976. On June 8, 1979, James Hunt officially announced his retirement from Formula One racing, effective immediately. Within a matter of weeks, BBC reached out to James to hire him as a broadcaster to cover Formula One on their TV channel. He agreed, and for about a decade and a half, had a successful career in broadcast. While the movie makes it seem like Nicky Lauda went a completely different route and stayed in Formula One racing while James Hunt retired, that's not entirely true. You see, Nicky also retired from Formula One racing in 1979. The big difference is that after his retirement and decision to focus on a new airline that he started called Lauda Air... Nicky returned to Formula One racing in 1982. He'd go on to win another world championship in 1984 before retiring for a second time in 1985. As for James Hunt, he tried to return to Formula One in 1980, but McLaren's sponsor, Marlboro, was only wanting to offer James about half of the $1 million that he was asking for. Any chance of seeing James behind the wheel on the track disappeared when James broke his leg in a skiing accident and Marble just pulled their offer. Which is interesting because just a couple years later in 1982, James was offered £2.6 million to race for another team. That's about the same as $11 million in today's US dollars. He turned that down. In his personal life, James and Susie never reunited, but toward the end of 1983, James met and fell for a waitress named Helen Dyson. She was almost 20 years younger than James, but neither of them seemed to care about the age difference. On June 13, 1993, James Hunt covered his last event for the BBC when he rode his bicycle 10 or so miles from his home in Wimbledon to the BBC's studios at Television Centre in London. It's about 16 kilometers. That event was the 1993 Canadian Grand Prix. The following day, James called Helen and proposed to her over the phone. That night, we can only assume he went to sleep a happy man, an engaged man. Unfortunately, he never woke up. James Hunt passed away in his sleep on the morning of June 15, 1993, due to what doctors would later determine was a heart attack. Just like the movie says, he was only 45. As of this recording, Nikki Lauda is still alive. As we learned earlier, Nikki was one of the consultants on the film, Rush, and he's had the chance to see it since it was released. Nikki has gone on record a number of times praising the filmmakers for accurately portraying the events on screen. If there's one regret that he has, though, it's that James could never see the film. In an interview with The Telegraph, Nicky was reminiscing about James and the movie when he said, quote, The saddest thing is he isn't here now. I wish he could have seen the movie because I know for sure he would have enjoyed it. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. As accurate as the movie is, there's so much more to the story. If you want to learn more, I would highly recommend a book called James Hunt, A Biography by Gerald Donaldson. I'll put a link to that and plenty of other resources over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the answer to the true truths in a lie game, I would like to once again offer my sincere thanks 
to Soren Boasny for picking out and sponsoring this episode. Since the movie is pretty accurate, I'm sure you already knew everything we covered, but hopefully you enjoyed the episode regardless. Soren, thanks again for your support. If you want to support the show, dear listener, and you can do that by hopping over to patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. Your support goes directly to doing things like buying the research material and all of the other costs of the show. So thank you in advance. Okay, now it's time for reviews. Here is a great five-star review from Coco0877 entitled, So Much More Than a Movie Podcast, and I quote, Boats is so much more than a movie podcast. Dan puts in a level of research that I've never seen from any other film show, and his delivery of the facts is so engaging and fun to listen to. It's been a wonderful addition to my playlist, end quote. And I think I might know who this is, but I won't say who because I figure if someone wants their real name online, they will use their real name online. But since Coco0877 is obviously not their real name, I'll assume that at least, I'll respect that layer of anonymity. But with that said, I will say that I believe Coco0877 is a fellow podcaster, and so it really means a lot to hear such great feedback from anyone, especially a fellow podcaster who knows what it takes to put a show together. Anyway, thanks again, Coco0877, for taking the time to write a review. Finally, it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, James Hunt barely managed to win the world championship in 1976 by a single point. Number two, the world championship in 1976 was the last time either James Hunt or Nicky Lauda would win a championship. Number three, Nicky Lauda bought his way onto a Formula One team by taking out a bank loan. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number two. While the 1976 championship was James Hunt's one and only, Nicky Lauda, who was the reigning champion from 1975 until James won in 1976, would go on to take back the crown in 1977, as well as coming back from retirement to win in 1984. What do you think about the story of Nicky Lauda and James Hunt in the movie? Let me know in the Based on a True Story community on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash Based on a True Story podcast. And don't forget, you can pick up your own Based on a True Story t-shirt and merch over at Based on a True Story podcast.com slash merch. You can also follow the show on Instagram. It's at Based on a True Story podcast. And I like to post photos of the faces and places behind each episode of the podcast over there. You can find me online where I'm on Twitter at Dan Lefebvre, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Or if social media isn't your thing, you can shoot me a good old fashioned email at Dan at Based on a True Story podcast dot com. Thanks so much for listening. And I'll chat with you again really soon. Mm-hmm.